Um, okay, first I want to say I'm just absolutely thrilled um, to be here and delighted to represent class two, although there's a little bit of pressure associated with that. Um, so uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is the genetic basis of evolutionary change, the sort of molecular nuts and bolts of how organisms adapt to their environment. So I'm trained as an evolutionary geneticist, and so I felt compelled to start um, with Darwin, because I, one could argue that there are few fields that can really trace their roots back to one person, and in particular one book, that is, in this case, on the origin of species published in 1859. And we read this book with my evolution students every year, and every year I continue to be amazed by how much Darwin got right, given the paucity of information he had at the time compared to what we know now. And in this great book, he came out with, um, of course, his theory of evolution by natural selection, which is based on these three tenets, the idea that in a population there's com competition among individuals for resources and survival, that there's vari variation in the competitive ability of those individuals, and that the traits that make them more or less competitive um, are heritable and passed on from generation to generation. So we always celebrate how much Darwin knew, but here among friends, I'm going to reveal that he didn't know everything. And in particular, there was one thing he didn't know, because of course at the time it was unknowable, and that is the mechanism of trait inheritance. Of course he knew traits were inherited because he could see the resemblance between parents and their offspring, but he didn't know mechanistically how this worked. So what I'd like to do is start by telling you a brief anecdote that links Darwin to a second great discovery, and that is of DNA being that mechanism of inheritance. So what I'm showing you here, I don't expect you to read, um, but just to appreciate, this is Darwin's last publication, published just two weeks before he died in a little-known journal called Nature. And what this is, it's called, entitled On the Dispersal of Freshwater Bivalves, and really what it is is a natural history observation of a freshwater beetle with clamped to its leg was a cockle, or a little freshwater clam. And what's relevant to today's story is how Darwin got his hands on that um, specimen. He didn't collect it himself. It was sent to him by somebody who was an amateur naturalist, but a um, shoemaker by training, who lived in the British Midlands. He sent him this uh, specimen in the post, and there was a, a flurry of correspondence between the two. And this young shoemaker's name was Walter Drawbridge Crick. So it was about a century later that this shoemaker's grandson, with his colleague Jim Watson, and of course, key insights by Rosalind uh, Franklin, where they made that second great discovery, the three-dimensional structure of DNA, that missing mechanism of inheritance that Watson so humbly referred to as the secret of life. <laughs> so research in our lab is really motivated by the same questions that motivated Darwin, that is, trying to understand how this tremendous diversity in organisms evolved. But thanks to Watson and Crick, we look for answers to that question in the DNA code. So the main question that really drives what we're doing is trying to understand the genetic basis of traits that matter to organisms in their natural populations that improve their ability to survive, to reproduce. And in doing so, it's not just that we want to know what the genes are or the precise um, mutations are, but what we really want to do is, armed with these genes, then understand something about process and mechanism. So with these genes in hand, we can learn um, something about how these traits evolved, and we can also understand how single base pair changes in DNA can give rise to differences in traits, especially those ones that matter. So now I want to step back and tell you a little bit about how I got interested in this very specific question. So just like Melanie, I have a very similar story in that I was a late bloomer in terms of my interest in this case in biology. Um, and in fact, I went to UC Berkeley as an undergraduate. Um, there, with a slightly more modest goal, I wanted to be the ambassador to Holland. So it's a very specific goal. Um, but it turned out I had this chance meeting um, with this fellow here, uh, Bob Full, who I still have a hard time not calling him Dr. Full. Um, and he was kind enough, even though I had never taken a college-level science course, let me into his advanced comparative physiology um, course and the lab, and then eventually invited me to do research in his lab, where my role was to run cockroaches on treadmills, little teeny treadmills, um, because we were interested in their physiology and their biomechanics. Well, as it turned out, I didn't fall in love with cockroaches, but I did fall in love with the research process, that wonder of discovery. 
And so I set my sights on graduate school. With a brief interlude, um, I spent a year in Yellowstone National Park chasing down grizzly bears, which I decided was um, a little bit dangerous um, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, so I ended up applying to one graduate school, and luckily I got in. And again, luck came into play because I arrived at the same time as this hotshot young professor, Scott Edwards, who was inducted into the National Academy last year. And Scott, again, took a risk on me because I had never formally worked with test tubes, yet he was um, a molecular ecologist. And what he taught me to do was to interrogate the genome, genome and use molecular markers to answer um, and address questions about organismal biology. So the focus was on really that non-functional part of the genome and using those as markers to answer organismal questions. And then from here, I went to yet another public uh, university, the University of Arizona, where I worked under um, Michael Nachman. And here I switched my um, sights now not to focus on the non-functional part of the genome, but instead the part of the genome that encoded those genes that mattered for organisms in their natural habitat. And this is really the foundation of the work um, that has uh, made the rest of my career. So back to this question, what is the genetic basis underlying fitness-related traits? When I started my lab at UC San Diego, I decided that I needed to start a new system in which to address this question. So I'd like to introduce you to that major player uh, in my research program. So this is uh, paramiscus, otherwise known as deer mice, one of the most common uh, mammals in North America. Now, to many of you, this will look like an average mouse, but in fact, they fall outside of the split between our laboratory models of mouse and rat, diverged by about 25 million years. And what's great about this is that they really represent their own evolutionary lineage, so we can learn things in these species that we may not have learned by studying just mouse and rat. But at the same time, they're closely enough related to those models that we can borrow or steal those wonderful genetic and genomic tools that have been so thoughtfully developed in those model organisms. So like laboratory mice, we can bring them into the lab, they breed readily, and we can do wonderfully controlled experiments. We can borrow that information from uh, genetic information from our laboratory models, and our group, among uh, others, are developing new molecular and genetic resources. But here's what's different about these mice, is that they're non-human commensals, and so they're found in a huge diversity of habitats across North America. Here's the distribution of just one species. You can trap them on the top of the Rockies, the coast of California, the deserts of Arizona. And because they live in this tremendous diversity of habitats, it may not be surprising that there's a lot of both genetic and phenotypic diversity uh, among these populations. And this is the diversity that we really focus on. So some of the first observations about the diversity among um, populations of paramiscus really rests on, uh, on people like this. This is Francis Sumner. He's a classic natural historian associated with the Natural History Museum who spent the bulk of his career driving around the US, trapping mice, and describing variation. And in fact, he was interested in ma many of the same questions that we're interested in today. We're just armed with new, sophisticated molecular tools to ask them and answer them at a different level. So one of the things he noticed is that when he would trap mice in particular habitats, there was a close resemblance between the soil color in which he trapped mice and the dorsal coats of, the, of those mice. So for example, if you were going to um, focus on this particular species and you went out to a field in uh, Florida, you would catch a mouse and it would look something like this. But by contrast, if you went and trapped these same species in a different part of their range, for example, on the beautiful white sand beaches of the Gulf Coast of Florida, you set out your traps, and you, caught a, and you caught a mouse, it would look something like this, okay? So now, all, with our intuition, we could imagine that being a light-colored mouse running around on light-colored soil would be an advantage to visually hunting predators, but of course, we wanted to prove that was actually true by doing an experiment. So this is an experiment that was done largely by undergraduates in the lab, led by a postdoc in which we made models of mice, painted them different colors, released them in different soil uh, types, and looked at which ones were attacked. And just like our intuition would suggest, the mice that matched their habitats, like dark ones and dark habitats, light ones and light habitats, had fewer attacks relative to those mismatched mice. So what this experiment told us is that color matters for survival. In fact, it matters a lot for survival. And it told us something about their predators, largely avian predators and mammalian carnivores. So now that we knew something about how these populations were diverging, we went from the field back to the lab to try to understand the underlying genetic basis. I'm going to skip through about six years of work and show you um, one of the um, results. 
So we were able to, by um, bringing these mice into the lab, genetically dissecting the uh, underlying uh, genetic regions, identify um, several genes, one of which is the melanocortin-1 receptor. It sits on the, uh, the cell wall of melanocytes, those cells that are responsible for making pigments. And you can think of this as a sort of molecular switch telling um, that cell whether to produce dark pigment, the brown to black pigment you have in your hair, or pheomelanin, which is responsible for the blonde to red pigment. When we sequenced this gene in the beach mice versus the mainland mice, we found only one difference. It was a single nucleotide difference that coded for an amino acid difference, which are um, shown here as circles. Oops, Let's see if I can go back. Can you go back one for me? Not that's okay. So that um, one amino acid um, change, uh, that one nucleotide change code for an amino acid difference, um, but it didn't overlap with any of the previous amino acid differences that we had known from this gene. And so what that led us to do is a second experiment, and that was to show that this amino acid had an effect um, on the receptor structure and function. So now we turn from genetics to pharmacology. We could express these receptors in different cell, in cell types with just that one nucleotide difference, and we could show that there's a difference in the activity as we added activator. We could measure the receptor activity. Here's that um, version of the receptor from the dark mouse versus the light mouse. So what this suggested is that single amino acid mutation had an effect on structure and function of that receptor. So now let's step back a minute and sort of review what I've told you so far. So what we were able to do was to identify a single nucleotide change, which coded for an amino acid change, which gave rise to a change in the protein function, which is largely responsible for the color differences between these two mice, and we know that color matters for their survival in the wild. So here is one of the first examples in which we could connect a single DNA base pair change to fitness in a natural population. And in making this connection between genes and traits, um, we were able to learn something about the evolutionary process, how populations start to diverge, and this is in a key part in, in terms of how species are, uh, how species evolve. And in addition, we learned something about molecular mechanism, how DNA is encoded and how that um, variation in that DNA can give rise to these differences. As all good scientific pro projects, um, more questions emerged and new insights that were quite surprising. So let me um, tell you about some of those. So these particular mice that we've been studying were on the Gulf Coast of Florida, but there are also beach mice that occur on the Atlantic Coast of Florida that look very similar. Quite to our surprise, they don't um, encode the same nucleotide change, and there are no other mutations in this gene that give rise to the same or convergent phenotype. So here's a case within the same species. You have different genetic solutions to this common ecological problem of wanting to be a white mouse living on white sand. But at the same time, we found examples in which very divergent organisms use similar um, genetic changes. So at the time we were working on this um, project, there were folks in Germany working on um, extracting DNA from extinct organisms, and they focused on mammoths initially, this was about 10 years ago, um, because mammoths, their bones were um, preserved in the permafrost of Siberia. This is like keeping DNA in a giant outdoor freezer. So they had good quality DNA, and they decided to sequence um, a gene, and the gene they chose was the melanocortin-1 receptor. So I was sitting at a conference next to a colleague who was working on this project, and we decided to compare sequences. And it turns out that they found in three specimens of mammoths a single nucleotide change. That nucleotide change occurred at position 65, the same one I told you about in beach mice, and it encoded the same arginine to cysteine change, which suggests that mammoths, like beach mice, may have been polymorphic in color as well. This gene also plays a role in a number of other color variants, some that may be more familiar um, to you, these are different mutations that cause the same effect, whether that's changes in uh, cows, in lizards, the, some living on the white sands of New Mexico, some living in the desert. I best, bet you can guess which is which. This gene also has variants that are at high frequency in some human populations, like I Irish populations. And again, using examples from ancient DNA, now we have um, sequences from, uh, whole genome sequences from species like Neanderthals, and when you look at the genetic variation in this gene in Neanderthals populations, it suggests that there are also mutations that are not the same ones in, um, in current human populations, but that probably gave rise to Neanderthals that look like this. 
So these mice have been e extremely useful in trying to make this connection between genes and phenotypes. Our lab started out focusing on pigmentation because that's a very tractable um, system. But since then, we've been exploring a whole number of traits that vary between species or populations of these mice. So we've been exploring the genetic basis of exploratory behavior. So our old field mice um, live in open habitats where they roam around um, much more so than um, ones that live in forests. We can put, use um, experiments in the lab and look at these differences. These mice also differ in mating systems. Some are promiscuous, some are monogamous. We can cross these, look at the effects of parental behavior. So we just had a paper published two weeks which we were two weeks ago in which we were able to identify a gene that gives rise to differences in parental behavior. Because these mice have different mating systems, there's some species that compete a lot more. Um, the males compete for access to the females. Um, and this has effects on the reproductive uh, behavior as well as the reproductive traits. So for example, um, in males from promiscuous species have sperm that swim much faster um, than those uh, that are monogamous. And We've been able to identify genes that give rise to differences in their ability um, to sire offspring. So as I um, conclude here, I want to leave you with three um, parting thoughts. The first one um, is that the work that we've um, been developing in our lab, as you've um, seen, is highly reliant on these amazing natural history observations and specimens contained in natural history museums. Um, and as we develop more and new sophisticated molecular tools, these observations and specimens are becoming, uh, are continually being relevant to that um, work um, in, in new ways and unexpected ways. Second, our work has really relied on the ability to develop new non-traditional model organisms where we've been able to discover things that we probably couldn't discover if we focused only on a handful of models. So these um, non-traditional model organisms have allowed us to develop systems that are sort of wonderfully complementary to our laboratory models. And then finally, I think I'm going to be singing to the choir here. Um, our work is deeply rooted in basic science, addressing fundamental um, questions, but I'm continually surprised about the results from our work and others in which, in very unexpected ways, we've had either indirect or direct um, implications for um, health and uh, um, human, human health and medicine. So with that, let me um, move on to um, my thank yous. Just like Melanie, um, our work was really reliant on this wonderful group of students who have um, been engaged in the lab initially at UC San Diego, uh, shown here. And then uh, when I moved to, I did it again, when I moved to Harvard um, uh, now 10 years ago. And I also want to thank all my colleagues. Um, I've been involved in a number of different departments and groups. Um, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which allowed me to be part of that community, as well as um, funding. And then finally, I want to thank um, my family. Um, it's not surprising that my uh, dad is here in the front row, no less, um, providing his support. So my dad and mom have always been um, absolutely incredible in um, encouraging me to work hard and pursue my dreams. And then finally, the two lights of my life, my husband, also an evolutionary geneticist, and my son. Uh, my son recently announced that he wants to be a scientist too, but he doesn't want to work on mice or butterflies like my husband, but he wants to work on trains because he doesn't know how those work. <laughs> so um, with that, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Thank you. We have time for two questions. So thank you for the beautiful talk, Hoppy. So you have been really tracing uh, all the trajectory uh, from a particular amino acid change to fitness changing trait. In a sense, it was a very traditional change, particular radical amino acid substitution. So let me ask you, what is your take on the grand picture? What is the fraction of nucleotides in a mammalian genome that you ultimately can trace to fitness? That's a good question. We're trying our hardest to get as many of those examples um, as we can, as, of course, several other labs. Um, I think that for us, the success in being able to link nucleotide changes to particular traits has really relied on very carefully choosing the traits that we go after. So starting with pigmentation being a trait that's easy to measure, um, that has clear ecological relevance, uh, that we had a wonderful list of candidate pigmentation genes to start off with. 
Um, so in those cases, I think we have high hopes of being able to make those connections. But as I alluded to at the end, we're now moving to much more complicated traits like behavior, um, which is complicated in so many ways in the sense that it's much harder to measure. We don't have a good list of candidate genes, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think those cases are going to be slower, but I have high hopes we're going to be able to do it. In terms of the proportion of the genome in which we can do this, oh, I think that's anybody's um, guess. I tend to be an optimist. Nobody's writing this down. This isn't being filmed, is it? Five percent? I know, I know. <laughs> Five percent. We'll argue over this later. <laughs> question or a quick version of your question. Go ahead. Yeah. Right, so I, I would say that um, we know now from the field of comparative genomics that most of our genes are highly conserved, both in terms of gene content, but also um, sort of the sequences, especially for those genes that provide these fundamental sort of um, roles like Hox genes or early developmental genes that are largely conserved. So what I would say to that is that our lab is really focused on trying to find not all the things that are conserved, but we're particularly lo looking for differences. Um, and, you know, for traits that are inherited, we're always going to be able to at least try to find those um, differences. And so I think there's a bit of a difference in focus in terms of looking at conservation versus looking for those differences. So we're just focused on the other side. <laughs>